In a world saturated with crime dramas and murder mysteries, it's easy to forget that these killers weren't just characters in a show. They were breathing, walking, and unfortunately, killing human beings. Movies and podcasts might sprinkle some Hollywood magic on these stories, but let's not lose sight of the harsh reality. Families shattered, lives destroyed, and communities left in fear. These are the aftermaths of the true crime stories we binge on. I wish you pure hell when you walk back into those gates and you enter your cell. Again, I hope every night when you close your eyes, you dream of the four people that you killed. So in this video, we're hitting pause on the glamorization. No fancy editing or cinematic scores, just raw footage of these monsters caught on camera. Stephen Griffiths. From a young age, Griffiths displayed alarming signs of sadistic and psychopathic behavior that would eventually lead him down a path of unimaginable horror. Born and raised in Bradford, England, Griffiths grew up in a seemingly ordinary family. As a child, he would often torture and kill small animals, a disturbing behavior that is often seen as a red flag for future violent tendencies. As Griffiths grew up, his interest in violent video games and movies deepened. He spent a lot of time playing and watching them, finding excitement in the violence shown. This led to a warped perspective, where violence became something he was fascinated with and enjoyed. His sadistic tendencies were not limited to fictional realms. Griffiths would often engage in acts of cruelty towards his peers. He would taunt and bully others, deriving a sick sense of satisfaction from their anguish. These early signs of sadism were clear indicators of the darkness that lay within him. As Griffiths grew older, his fascination with violence took a more disturbing turn. He became fixated on serial killers and their methods, studying their crimes with a morbid curiosity. He would meticulously research their actions, seeking to understand the inner workings of their twisted minds. This obsession with serial killers led Griffiths to pursue a degree in criminology, a field that allowed him to delve deeper into the darkest corners of human behavior. It was during his time as a criminology PhD student that he began to experiment with his violence violent fantasies, using his academic pursuits as a cover for his sinister desires. But it wasn't just his academic pursuits that provided an outlet for his sadistic tendencies. Griffiths would often engage in disturbing online forums where he would share his violent fantasies and connect with like-minded individuals. These online communities served as an echo chamber, fueling his already twisted desires. As time went on, Griffiths's fascination with violence became increasingly difficult to contain. He would often engage in self-harm, relishing in the pain and bloodshed. This self-destructive behavior was a manifestation of his inner turmoil, a desperate attempt to satisfy his insatiable appetite for violence. The signs of Griffiths's psychopathy were evident to those who crossed his path. He lacked empathy and remorse, showing a complete disregard for the well-being of others. His interactions with people were often manipulative and calculated, with the sole purpose of fulfilling his own sadistic desires. It is important to note that not all individuals with a fascination for violence become killers. However, in the case of Stephen Griffiths, his dark obsessions would eventually spill over into the real world, leaving a trail of devastation station in his wake. As Stephen Griffiths's dark fascination with violence continued to consume him, he set his sights on the vulnerable women of the Red Light District in Bradford. It was in this city that he would carry out his heinous acts, preying on those who were already marginalized and desperate. In June 2009, the disappearance of Susan Rushworth shocked the community. Susan, a sex worker known to many in the area, vanished without a trace, leaving her family and friends devastated and desperate for answers. Little did they know that Susan would be the first victim in a series of horrifying crimes committed by Griffiths. Susan's disappearance was not initially linked to Griffiths, as the police struggled to uncover any leads. The red light district was a dangerous and volatile place, making it difficult to pinpoint the perpetrator. But behind closed doors, Griffiths reveled in the power and control he had over his victims, relishing in the fear and pain he inflicted upon them. As the investigation into Susan's disappearance continued, Griffiths continued his reign of terror. He would lure unsuspecting women into his apartment, promising them money or drugs, only to subject them to unspeakable acts of violence. His sadistic nature knew no bounds, and he took pleasure in the suffering he inflicted upon his victims. The red light district became a hunting ground for Griffiths as he carefully selected his targets. He preyed on the vulnerability of these women, exploiting their desperate circumstances for his sick gratification. They were seen as disposable, mere objects to satisfy his twisted desires. The disappearances continued, with more women vanishing without a trace. The community was gripped with fear and paranoia as the realization that a serial killer was on the loose began to sink in. But Griffiths remained elusive, his true identity hidden behind a facade of normalcy. It wasn't until the discovery of CCTV footage that the police finally caught a glimpse of the monster in their midst. The chilling footage showed Griffiths dragging the lifeless body of his final victim back into his apartment, unaware that his every move was being captured on camera. This crucial piece of evidence would ultimately lead to his downfall. In fact, 
In one of the videos, Griffiths was aware of the CCTV camera and even acknowledged it with his middle finger. Stephen Griffiths was arrested as the true extent of his crimes began to unravel. During his interrogation, he admitted to killing more women than the three known victims. Stephen Griffiths's reign of terror was marked by a level of brutality that defied comprehension. His sadistic acts of violence against his victims were nothing short of horrifying. It was these gruesome acts that earned him the chilling nickname that would forever be associated with him, the Crossbow Cannibal. Griffiths's choice of weapon was as unconventional as it was terrifying. The Crossbow, a medieval weapon associated with archaic violence, became his tool of choice to carry out his heinous acts. But it wasn't just the choice of weapon that made Griffiths's crimes so shocking. The level of sadism and depravity he displayed was beyond comprehension. It is believed that he not only killed his victims, but also dismembered their bodies. The details that emerged during the investigation were nothing short of horrifying. Griffiths would subject his victims to unimaginable torture, reveling in their pain and suffering. His acts of violence were calculated and methodical, leaving no room for mercy or compassion. It is believed that Griffiths took pleasure in the dismemberment of his victims' bodies. This sickening act defied all notions of humanity. The extent of his depravity knew no bounds, as he allegedly consumed parts of their bodies, further cementing his status as a monster. Why, why did you feel the need to, to kill her? I don't know. I've just sometimes you killed someone to kill yourself or killed parents. So I don't know, I don't know. While he was jailed and awaiting trial, he also refused to eat. This has now gone on a hunger strike, refusing all food and drink. It isn't clear today what shape he's in, but by Christmas Day, he'd reported he'd lost 40 pounds and was in a weak state. During his trial, the full extent of Griffiths's sadistic acts was laid bare, for all to see. The details were too gruesome to comprehend. The judge described the circumstances of the murders as wicked and monstrous. As the trial reached its conclusion, the judge delivered a sentence that reflected the wickedness and horror of Griffiths's actions. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole, ensuring that he would never walk free again. It was a fitting punishment for a man who had shown no remorse for the pain and suffering he had inflicted upon his victims. The families of the victims, relieved by the verdict, faced the ongoing impact of Griffiths's crimes. Their lives were forever changed, and the pain was immeasurable. The community, shocked by the brutality, worked to support the families and prevent such a tragedy from happening again. Nathan Menard Ellis and David Leasley The CCTV footage allegedly captures serial killers Nathan Menard Ellis and David Leasley disposing of evidence related to the murder of Julia Rosson. In the video, they are seen taking something from their car and later revealed to be the dismembered body of the victim. The footage shows them approaching a canal where the body was later hidden in black plastic bags. Authorities discovered the body a month after the murder. The video also appears to show them disposing of other items, including a blood-stained sofa, burned clothing, and rugs. Let's look at the details of this crime. As the sun set on a seemingly ordinary evening in May 2019, the stage was set for a chilling encounter that would forever change the lives of those involved. Julia Rosson, a 42-year-old artist known for her vibrant personality and rock star-like style, ventured out into the night, unaware of the darkness that awaited her. It was on that fateful night that Julia crossed paths with Nathan Maynard Ellis, a man whose obsession with serial killers would soon take a sinister turn. The two strangers met at a local pub, their lives on a collision course that would lead to unimaginable horrors. Julia didn't know that Nathan had a violent past and was really into the minds of serial killers. His apartment in Tipton was creepy, full of horror movie stuff, like a shrine to the scary thoughts in his head. As the night wore on, Julia and Nathan found themselves drawn to each other. Little did Julia know that this seemingly innocent encounter would be her last. CCTV footage would later reveal the haunting moments that sealed Julia's fate. The cameras captured her and Nathan leaving the pub together. They hailed a taxi, their destination set for Nathan's flat, where the horrors awaited. Julia's partner, Elaine Higginson, grew increasingly worried as the hours ticked by and Julia failed to return home. The sense of unease turned into panic, and Elaine made the gut-wrenching decision to report Julia missing to the authorities. The police, armed with the CCTV footage, embarked on a desperate search for clues to unravel the mystery surrounding Julia's disappearance. Their investigation led them straight to Nathan Maynard Ellis, the man she had last been seen with. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly falling into place, revealing a chilling truth. Nathan, with his partner in crime, David Leasley, would soon find themselves in the spotlight of a nationwide manhunt. The police, armed with the evidence captured on CCTV, wasted no time in searching for the two men. At some point, law enforcement agents hit the street, searching for answers. While addressing a gathering of people, someone recognizes the person from the flyer, informs the police, and points out Nathan on the street. The police approach Nathan and explain that they are looking for information about Julia. They mention seeing someone matching his description on CCTV footage with Julia. We're, we're looking for 
looking for a female looking missing for a person female who's been missing, missing for about 11 days. Okay, she's been missing yeah. for 11 days, so obviously we need to find her. Okay. And because you, you look like the person we've seen on CCTV, we just get some details off you. Right. Nathan denies being the person in the footage. Nathan's boyfriend, David Leasley, also denies it and claims they were in bed that night. Despite their denials, both Nathan Maynard Ellis and David Leasley are arrested by the police. Their flat, located near a canal and an old railway line, became the centre of a gruesome discovery. As the authorities entered the flat, they found the signs of human remains of Julia Rosson. The gruesome nature of Julia's demise is almost unbelievable. Despite the overwhelming evidence, Nathan and David denied any involvement in Julia's death. They claimed that her tragic demise was nothing more than a terrible accident, but the evidence painted a different picture, one that revealed the depths of Nathan's obsession with decapitation and his disturbing fantasies about the sexualized killing of women. The trial was intense and unsettling, exposing the darkest aspects of human behavior for the whole nation to witness. The prosecutors showed a lot of evidence, carefully putting together the story of what happened to Julia. They described a man who was deeply obsessed, fascinated by dark and creepy things that had taken Taken over his life. Witnesses took the stand, recounting chilling encounters with Nathan. They spoke of his disturbing fantasies, his obsession with decapitation, and his sexualized visions of killing women. The courtroom was gripped by a sense of unease as the depths of Nathan's depravity were exposed. The jury had to deal with strong evidence and emotional testimonies. Nathan and David's defense argued that Julia's death was an accident, but the evidence strongly supported a different conclusion. The prosecution presented the CCTV footage that captured Julia and Nathan leaving the pub together. They highlighted the moment they shared a taxi, their destination set for Nathan's flat. The footage became a haunting visual reminder of the last moments of Julia's life. Forensic experts took the stand, detailing the gruesome discoveries made within Nathan's flat. They described the human remains found in shopping bags and the dismemberment of Julia's body into 11 separate pieces. The courtroom was gripped by a collective gasp as the magnitude of the crime became painfully clear. As the trial reached its climax, the jury retired to deliberate, and when the verdict was finally announced, a collective sigh of relief mingled with the weight of sorrow. Nathan Maynard Ellis and David Leasley were found guilty of Julia Rosson's murder. The judge, in delivering the sentence, acknowledged the heinous nature of the crime. Nathan and David were sentenced to life in prison. Howell Emanuel Donaldson III was linked to a series of violent crimes. Ronald Felton's death, the fourth victim in a string of shootings, provided a potential breakthrough. Colleagues recognized the suspect in CCTV footage, resembling Howell. He was arrested after handing a pistol to his manager at McDonald's, where he worked. His co-workers had joked about his resemblance to the TV murderer, even calling him killer. I told him that you look like a killer. And he said, do I really? I said, yeah. You know, and I was just saying that because I've been saying stuff. I don't know why. I've just been digging at him, but he ain't do nothing to me. But he gave me that look like, don't mess with me. Let's take a more in-depth look at this case. Howell Emanuel Donaldson III is another name that would become synonymous with terror. Born and raised in Tampa, Florida, Donaldson's early years were marked by a relatively unremarkable upbringing. Donaldson's childhood was spent in the quiet suburbs of Tampa, where he grew up in a middle-class family. His parents provided a stable and loving environment for their son. There were no signs of the darkness that would later consume him. As a student, Donaldson attended local schools and showed average academic performance. He was known to be reserved and introverted, often keeping to himself. While he didn't excel in any particular subject, he displayed no alarming behavior or tendencies that would foreshadow the violence that lay ahead. After graduating from high school, Donaldson pursued higher education at a local community college. He enrolled in a general studies program, but his time in college was unremarkable. He didn't participate in any extracurricular activities or show any particular passion or drive for a specific career path. Following his college years, Donaldson entered the workforce, taking on various odd jobs to make ends meet. He worked in retail, restaurants, and even held a position at a local fast food chain. To those who knew him, he was just another face in the crowd, a quiet and unassuming presence. It was during this time that Donaldson's life took a dark turn. The details of what led him down this path remain largely unknown, as he kept his inner thoughts and struggles hidden from those around him. It is believed that a combination of personal issues, mental health challenges, and a sense of isolation may have contributed to his descent into violence. The transformation from an ordinary young man to a spree killer is a chilling reminder of the complexities of the human psyche. How did someone who seemed so unremarkable become capable of such horrific acts? It is a question that haunts both experts and the community alike. The first victim, Benjamin Edward Mitchell, was a 22-year-old African-American man with a promising future ahead of him. On October 9, 2017, Mitchell was waiting at a bus stop when he was ruthlessly gunned down. The community was left in shock and disbelief as news of the senseless killing spread. Mitchell's life was cut short, leaving his loved ones and the neighborhood mourning the loss of a young man with so much potential. Did well. Um, was on his way to be a, uh, a great young man. 
had a future. Just weeks later, on October 11th, 2017, the second victim, Monica Caridad Hoffa, met a similarly tragic fate. Hoffa, a 32-year-old white female, was found dead in an overgrown field. Her life had been brutally taken away, leaving her family and friends devastated. The community was gripped with fear as the realization set in that a cold-blooded killer was on the loose. The third victim, Anthony Naiboa, was a 20-year-old Hispanic man with autism. Naiboa's life was tragically cut short on October 19th, 2017, as he was walking home. In a cruel twist of fate, Naboa became an unintended target of Donaldson's violence. The fourth and final victim, Ronald Felton, was a 60-year-old man who was simply crossing the street when he was fatally shot on November 14, 2017. Each victim had their own unique story, dreams, and aspirations. They were sons, daughters, friends, and loved ones who had their lives abruptly stolen from them. In an effort to capture Howell Emanuel Donaldson III, a reward of $110,000 was offered for any information leading to his arrest. The response from the community was overwhelming. Tips and leads poured in as residents banded together to support the investigation. People shared information, suspicions, and any details that could potentially aid in the apprehension of the killer. The community's collective effort played a crucial role in the eventual capture of Donaldson. It was a breakthrough moment when Donaldson was arrested on November 28, 2017. He had handed a pistol in a bag to his manager at McDonald's, instructing her to bury it without opening it. The manager, Delonda Walker, acted swiftly and responsibly, alerting the authorities to the suspicious package. This pivotal moment would ultimately lead to Donaldson's capture and the beginning of the end of his reign of terror. Donaldson's trial was scheduled to begin in August 2020, with the eyes of the nation fixed on the proceedings. As the trial progressed, the prosecution presented a wealth of evidence linking Donaldson to the crimes. Surveillance footage placed him near the scenes of the murders. Additionally, a search of his vehicle uncovered clothing stained with what appeared to be blood, providing further damning evidence against him. Ballistics tests proved to be the final nail in the coffin. The tests conclusively showed that the gun found in the bag Donaldson had given to his manager at McDonald's was the weapon used in all four killings. The evidence against him was overwhelming, leaving little room for doubt. The courtroom was filled with a mix of emotions as the families of the victims, the community, and the media awaited the sentencing. The judge, faced with the gravity of the crimes committed, delivered a sentence that would ensure Donaldson would never walk free again. He was sentenced to four consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The sentencing brought a sense of closure to the victims' families, who had endured unimaginable pain and loss. Delonda Walker, the brave McDonald's manager who had alerted the authorities to the suspicious bag, was awarded the $110,000 reward for her crucial role in Donaldson's arrest. Richard Ramirez, the infamous Night Stalker, was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, in a violent and troubled family. His early life was marked by a series of traumatic events that would shape his twisted path toward becoming one of America's most notorious serial killers. Ramirez was born on February 29, 1960 to Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. He was the youngest of five children and grew up in a household plagued by domestic violence. His father, Julian, was known for his abusive behavior towards his wife and children, creating a toxic environment that would have a lasting impact on young Richard. As if the violence at home wasn't enough, Ramirez was exposed to a horrifying act of murder at a tender age. When he was just 12 years old, he witnessed his cousin, Miguel, shoot and kill his wife in a fit of rage. Despite the troubled upbringing, Ramirez showed signs of intelligence and charm. However, these qualities would be overshadowed by the darkness that lurked within him. As he entered his teenage years, Ramirez began to experiment with drugs and delve into Satanism. In 1982, at the age of 22, Ramirez made a fateful decision that would change the course of his life. He moved to California, seeking a fresh start and hoping to escape the demons of his past. Little did anyone know that this move would unleash a reign of terror that would grip the entire state. It is believed that Ramirez's killing spree may have started earlier than authorities initially thought, while his first known murder was in June 1984. There is speculation that he may have committed other crimes prior to this. The exact timeline of his crimes remains a subject of debate among investigators. Ramirez's reign of terror truly began with the murder of Jenny Vincow. On June 28, 1984, Ramirez broke into her apartment in Glassell Park, Los Angeles. He brutally attacked Vinco, stabbing her repeatedly and slashing her throat. This senseless act of violence would set the stage for the horrors to come. Following the murder of Vincow, Ramirez continued his spree of random attacks, often breaking into homes and assaulting his victims 
victims. His crimes knew no boundaries as he targeted both men and women, leaving a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. The level of violence and sadism displayed in his attacks was truly shocking, earning him the moniker of the Night Stalker. As news of the Night Stalker's crimes spread, the public lived in constant fear. The media coverage of the case only intensified the terror, as people locked their doors and windows, afraid to venture out after dark. Ramirez had become a household name, synonymous with evil and brutality. After the murder of Jenny Vincao in June 1984, Ramirez's reign of terror escalated rapidly. He embarked on a series of random attacks, targeting innocent victims in their own homes. Ramirez's modus operandi involved breaking into houses under the cover of darkness, often gaining access through unlocked doors or windows. The level of violence and sadism displayed in Ramirez's crimes was truly horrifying. He would surprise his victims while they slept, using a variety of weapons, including knives, guns, and blunt objects, to inflict unimaginable pain and suffering. His attacks were characterized by extreme cruelty, leaving his victims physically and emotionally scarred for life. One of the most shocking aspects of Ramirez's crimes was the indiscriminate nature of his target. This unpredictability only heightened the fear and panic among the public, as no one felt safe in their own homes. Ramirez's crimes were not limited to murder. He also committed a series of sexual assaults, further adding to the horror and trauma experienced by his victims. Despite the widespread fear, the breakthrough in the case came when a stolen car linked to Ramirez was discovered. Inside the vehicle, authorities found a crucial piece of evidence, Ramirez's fingerprint. This discovery provided a vital lead in the hunt for the Night Stalker, bringing investigators one step closer to capturing the elusive killer. With the identification of Ramirez as the prime suspect, the public's attention turned to the man behind the crimes. His face was plastered across newspapers and television screens as people tried to comprehend the evil that had been lurking in their midst. The hunt for Ramirez reached its climax on August 31, 1985, when a group of citizens in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles, recognized him and apprehended him. In 1989, Richard Ramirez stood trial for his heinous crimes. The evidence against him was overwhelming, including eyewitness testimonies, fingerprints, and the recovery of stolen items from his various crime scenes. The trial was a spectacle, drawing widespread media attention and public interest. Ramirez was convicted on multiple counts of murder, sexual assault, and burglary. He was sentenced to death, receiving 19 death penalties. However, his story did not end there. While in prison, Ramirez's dark charisma continued to captivate the public. He received numerous letters from admirers, some even expressing their love and admiration for him. In an unexpected turn of events, Ramirez married a longtime fan who had been drawn to his dark persona. While awaiting execution, Ramirez was interviewed. The interviewer asks him why he harmed and killed people, but Ramirez doesn't give an answer. He either couldn't or wouldn't talk about his reasons for the crimes. Why on earth would you have hurt those people? Why did you kill those people? Uh, no comments. No comments. I, I cannot answer the at this time. Ramirez believes in the presence of evil and sees it as a part of human nature. He thinks that people can be influenced by the negative aspects of the world they live in. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, wicked people are born. I'm not gonna blame society, my race, or people, or anything. Uh, Ramirez ends by stating he doesn't care about himself or what happens to him. He implies that he never cared, showing a lack of concern for personal consequences. I don't care about myself, really. You know, I don't care about what happens to me. I never did, really. In 2013, Richard Ramirez's life came to an end. He died in prison from complications of B-cell lymphoma, bringing an end to the life of one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. His death marked the final chapter in a dark and horrifying story that had gripped the nation. If you enjoyed this video, click on the card showing on your screen right now for more videos exposing heinous crimes.